I'm uh, joined here today by Mark Niehaus, the president of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra, and Susan Loris, who's the vice president for communications for the Milwaukee Symphony. I will provide the information that's available at this time, and I'll take your questions. Please recognize this investigation is in its early stages, and there's limited information that I can, in fact, provide. Last night, the artistic heritage of Milwaukee was assaulted and robbed. After a concert at Wisconsin Lutheran College, the concert master of the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra was assaulted and robbed of a rare and valuable Stradivarius violin. It was built in 1715. At approximately 10.20 last night, Frank Almond was walking to his car after performing at the college. As he approached his parked car, a suspect used an electronic control device, commonly called a taser, and struck him, causing him to drop the violin and fall to the ground. The suspect then took the violin and fled in a waiting car driven by a second suspect. The vehicle description is going to be projected behind me is a late 80s or early 90s Chrysler or Dodge minivan, maroon or burgundy in color. We have a photograph of that vehicle on the screen and have provided paper copies for all of you to use in your broadcasts or publications. It appears at this time that the violin was in fact the primary target of this robbery. It's important to note that this violin is very valuable, but very valuable to a very small population. This is not something that can be easily sold for even a fraction of its monetary value. We have a photograph of the Stradivarius violin being projected behind me, a copy of which will be given to each of you. Now this violin is commonly known as the Lipinski Stradivarius, and you will note if you look at the back of it, there are very specific striations that for a violin of this type are virtually the violin's fingerprint. This is what this violin looks like. And anybody that sees it or has knowledge of it will have very important information indeed. Now, the Milwaukee Police Department is working with the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Art Crimes Team stationed in Quantico, Virginia. This team specializes in high-end art theft. They have entered this violin into the National Art Theft Database, excuse me, the International Art Theft Database. They are all, have also notified Interpol. We will be monitoring their databases as this theoretically could be an international crime. We are following up on every lead. We encourage anyone with any information they have about this case to contact the Milwaukee Police Department. The number that we will use is 414-935-7360. If people with information are uncomfortable contacting us, then we urge them to contact the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. Their number for this complaint is 414-226-7800. Finally, I urge the media to please respect the privacy of our crime victim. It is unusual for us to identify the victim in a crime like this. We are doing it because the information was publicly available. But he is still a crime victim. He is still our witness. Please do not put him in a position where he may inadvertently give information under stress that could compromise the integrity and ultimately the success of this investigation. Now, having said that, I'm going to allow Mr. Niehaus 
to say a few words, and then uh, I will take what questions I can pertaining to this case. Mr. Niehaus. First, I'd like to thank Chief Flynn and the Milwaukee Police Department for their incredible work in this investigation. Their response was, was outstanding. Um, a member of our orchestra's family, uh, Frank Allman, our concertmaster, was attacked and his instrument was taken from him. Um, he is in good condition. Um, no one ever wants to be tasered. Um, he's recovering from that. Um, and. Uh, he, 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 will, he will not be on the stage this weekend. Um, and lastly, we make art, and we make wonderful art in Milwaukee, and part of our art are, are these instruments that were made for musicians hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and we continue to play these instruments in the tradition that they were built in. And the instruments need to be played to live on. So that's why these instruments are out in circulation and why they're played on stages all over the country. Um, this is the only Stradivarius in Milwaukee. Our orchestra is not filled with instruments like this. This was the only one. So um, we're very thankful to the police department, and we're very thankful that Frank is, is recovering at home. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Niehaus. Um, questions? Chief, is that the actual vehicle, or is that a similar vehicle? This is a picture of a similar vehicle. We don't know for sure if it was a Chrysler or a Dodge. We don't know for sure if it was burgundy or maroon, but we do know it was this general type of vehicle. Any description of the suspect? We're not releasing one at this time because the uh, description we were given is too generic to truly be helpful. And those people involved are located here in Milwaukee or could be as far away as overseas? Well, we don't know. Uh, we have no reason to believe that the uh, individuals who encountered Mr. Uh, Almond were from another country. Um, but uh, we certainly want to uh, follow up any notions of what, uh, who may have been behind this crime. Can you tell us how much the instrument uh, is worth? Um, I think functionally Mr. Niehaus would agree that it's priceless. I think it's a practical matter. These violins uh, routinely sell for the high seven figures. Has this ever happened before in the uh, It's not happened in Milwaukee. It does occasionally happen on the international market. It's one of the reasons why Interpol and the FBI collaborate on this, but as that collaboration also indicates, and as I said in my remarks, these are wildly valuable to a tiny slice of the art world. And so having it really does you no good um, unless you know somebody in that world who's prepared to essentially never let it see the light of day again. As has been indicated by any expert in this field, these things have to be played to in fact maintain their value. So it's uh, not something that could very easily be translated into cash by your average criminal. With a high seven-figure value, what does this rate as far as thefts in this area? Well, I think this is a, a standalone. I mean, certainly the nature of it makes it highly unusual. This is art theft. This is a significant art theft as if someone broke into our art museum and stole our most valuable paintings. This is a theft of art. And so, obviously, we have to explore whether this was just two serendipitous criminals who got, you know, wildly lucky, so to speak, or whether or not it's something else at work. But I can't emphasize enough that for our average criminal, there's no real place to go with this. You know, you can't take it for a pawn shop and recover anything remotely uh, connected to its value. Do you know if the suspects actually spoke to Mr. Allman, or was he just teased? Um, there are some information. I really don't want to get in any details about the, the specifics of the criminal act. Uh, I need to keep that general. In these cases such as this, do you, though, work with pawn shops that might have someone come in not knowing what they have? We, uh, we check with, you know, local pawn shops. We connect with international databases. You know, we put this out in every information venue we can. I mean, routinely, when someone is burgled and their jewelry is stolen, uh, we do our best to enter it into the computer system that the pawn shops use. So I want our <coughs> victims of crime in Milwaukee to know that the nuts and bolts of this follow-up, they get the benefit of as well. We don't put every local burglary into the Interpol system, but we certainly uh, check the, uh, the uh, pawn shop records in the uh, metropolitan area when someone's uh, house is burgled. And something of this value, uh, has there ever been any thoughts of the security? 
We do take extra precautions with this instrument um, at our home, the Marcus Center, and in the way that it's handled. And um, it's, in my opinion, all those precautions were in place at this at, during this time. What is the actual order of the instrument? Uh, it's my understanding that the uh, owner of this violin wishes to remain anonymous and uh, you know, lent the violin uh, to the concert master for his use with the symphony and also his you know, concert use. So, uh, you know, that information is not available to me, uh, but uh, Mr. Allman is not, the, uh, is not the owner of it. Is there any sort of reward being offered? Um, at this time, no. Um, I've had conversations with Milwaukee Symphony. It's quite honestly far too soon uh, for them to make that determination. There's a lot of uh, people engaged in the decision-making process that I'm sure have to be consulted. I would certainly say at this point we don't want to do anything that's going to encourage someone to hold on to it if they know about it. We're going to encourage people to come forward and do the right thing. Should other musicians in the area be concerned for their own safety that there could be more of these happening? Um, these events are really rare, okay? There are only a few in recent years in the United States. I would stress that uh, to anyone who thinks that this might be, you know, a profitable line of work. This is the standalone instrument used by the MSO. Nobody else in this symphony has an instrument remotely as valuable for historic or artistic or monetary purposes as this instrument. So this was it. Um, it would truly not be worth anybody's while to uh, stake out the MSO in vain hopes of getting an instrument anywhere near as valuable. How long has uh, the instrument been used by the MSO? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Four years. I'm sorry? Since 2000. Since 2008. And it's actually, it's quite normal in the art world for a donor or, or an investor to own the instrument and then loan the instrument to uh, a very high level artist. That's, that tends to be the default way these instruments make their way onto our concert stages. Is it a local donor? Pardon me? Local donor? I'm not prepared to say that. Could, could you, you describe why, uh, you said a little bit, these instruments have been used artistically or musically, why, what's the quality of the sets of the part? Or? It's made out of wood, and it needs to be touched, and it needs to be held, and it needs to be played. And the vibe, and the vi literally the vibrations of the music keep the wood alive. It's actually quite a beautiful thing. But is it a better, I just need to hear you say, is it a better sound quality? What, what? With a Stradivarius violin? Hmm. How, did you, how would you, you know that's that's an interesting conversation because you you have people on either sides of this. There also is you know there could be the arg argument of the supply and demand. Something that was made over 350 years ago, the supply is so limited. There's a mystique behind them, um, but there is no arguing that this Lip Lipinski Stradivarius has an incredible sound, especially when played by an artist of the caliber of our concertmaster Frank Allman. You said it will would literally physically be damaged if it's not played. They rot. Is it insured? I believe so. Of course. <laughs> is, this, is this a picture uh, of the violin, the actual violin? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, we were able to get it uh, offline. So that's the actual violin? That's the actual violin. As I say, if you look at the back of it, those are really identifying characteristics that would be helpful uh, to know. That's why we're sharing it with you. Okay? Thank you.